When Mary Shelley titled her novel Frankenstein, she gave it the subtitle The Modern Prometheus. In so doing, she made the book's central metaphor explicit. Just as in ancient Greek mythology, the titan Prometheus bestows fire unto mankind and suffers as a result, so does Dr. Frankenstein bestow life unto dead flesh and suffer as a result. There's an important difference, however, which Shelley highlights. In Greek mythology, Prometheus suffers for his deed because he is punished by higher powers. Dr. Frankenstein, however, has nobody to blame for his suffering other than himself, since he chose to abandon his creation out of disgust. With this slight difference, Shelley raises an important question about the relationship between God and humankind. It's the question which William Blake raises about God's relationship to the tiger. Did he smile his work to see? Or has God, like Shelley's titular scientist, abandoned humankind out of disgust? These questions and these themes of science, retribution, creation, and enlightenment will all be featured in today's adventure. Welcome to phd and everyone, I'm Dr. Bowers, and today we're going to explore the Ravenloft domain of dread called Lamordia, a blizzard-enshrouded domain of ice and science gone mad. As with all my Ravenloft videos, we'll talk about what the domain is, list some media to help us get an imaginative grip on the place, and then sketch out an adventure. Our adventure will take PCs from levels 2 through 5, that is, they will finish the adventure at level 5 and with DM's permission at the end level up to 6, and it will occur across 4 acts. Our adventure incorporates a deep and creeping darkness from Candlekeep Mysteries, as well as elements from Rime of the Frostmaiden and the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. Before we get started, however, what is the domain of Lamordia? Well, frozen bogs and glacial expanses surround Lamordia's smog and machinery-filled cities. Unpredictable blizzards plague the long winters, and the chill summers only last a few weeks. Those who brave the wilds must contend with starving predators, from wolf packs and giant owls to isolated humanoid clans struggling to subsist outside of the domain's iron-walled cities. The cruel environment and populace threatened by starvation make Lamordia a crucible of desperate innovations. Claiming to work for the greater good, innovators and scholars push beyond the limits of morality. Their scalpels turn scientific pursuits into butchery as their experiments reach beyond what is necessary for health to grasp after the secrets of existence. Flesh is Lamordia's most abundant natural resource, exploited for both desperate purposes and vain ambitions. And no ambitions have led to greater evils than the work of the Domain's Dark Lord, Dr. Victra Mordenheim. So Lamordia is, as Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft says, a domain of snow and stitched flesh. It's obviously influenced by Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, but there are other bits of media which can be equally influential in shaping a Lamordia adventure. In addition to the 1818 novel Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus, and in addition to the 1994 film adaptation Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, directed by Kenneth Branagh, it's also worth considering H.P. Lovecraft's 1922 multi-part story Herbert West, Reanimator, and also Stuart Gordon's delightful 1985 film adaptation, which takes some fun liberties. I also recommend both versions of the film The Fly, the original 1958 version starring Vincent Price, and the gruesome 1986 adaptation by David Cronenberg starring Jeff Goldblum. In each of these tales, you have the parable of the scientist whose reach exceeds his grasp, and who produces only suffering and horror. We will, of course, take elements from all of these works of fiction in our adventure, but some other works of fiction will exercise a more considerable influence. The first two are works by Arthur Machen, and they both concern the specific topic of... Home Brain Surgery! Yes, brain surgery. The first story, The Inmost Light, tells a gruesome tale of a scientist who does brain surgery on his wife, hoping to capture the human soul. The horror comes not only from the brain surgery, not only from the extraction of the soul, but also from what moves in and takes up the place of the soul when the soul is gone. Similar to that is the novel The Great God Pan, in which a mad scientist pursues brain surgery in order to enable his patients to see into another realm of existence, a realm in which the Great God Pan is said to dwell. This idea of brain surgery to enable a second sight is going to feature heavily in our adventure. In fact, that's what's going to happen to the PCs. Similar to The Inmost Light and The Great God Pan is H.P. Lovecraft's 1934 tale, From Beyond, and also the 1986 film adaptation directed by Stuart Gordon. 
In this story, a scientist uses a machine to stimulate a subject's pineal gland, and in so doing, enable them to see into other realms of existence. And unfortunately, such a fate does not bode well. For just as, in that stimulated state, the subject can see into other realms of existence, those other realms and their denizens can also see back. This plot is very similar to Episode 6 of Season 1 of the Nickelodeon series Are You Afraid of the Dark from 1992, called The Tale of the Super Specs. It's one more tale of somebody being able to see into another realm of existence that overlaps with our own by way of some technical or even magical abilities. And the same theme can be found in the short film Phase 1 Clinical Trials from the 2013 film VHS 2. In it, a man gets an ocular implant only to discover that the implant is haunted, specifically resulting in the effect that he can see ghosts, and the ghosts can see him too. And also, before mentioning official Ravenloft stuff, it's worth paying attention to the 1960 film Eyes Without a Face, a work of horrific cinematic art all about an ill-willed surgeon who abducts people and, well, removes their faces. Highly recommend it, it's a powerful work of cinematic art. And finally, I recommend the 1994 Ravenloft adventure for second edition D&D, Adam's Wrath, written by Lisa Smedman. We're going to take the plot of this adventure, change a few things, and adapt it to 5th edition. And there's also the 2023 graphic novel and comic book series Ravenloft, Orphan of Agony Isle. Written by Casey Gilley and illustrated by Bailey Underwood, this comic tells the story of someone who wakes up on Victra Mordenheim's operating table. As she discovers who and where she is, we learn a lot about the domain of Lamordia, and even more about the Dark Lord Victra Mordenheim, who is clearly based on Dr. Frankenstein. While it doesn't supply an adventure for us to adapt, it does give us a lot of lore about the domain and some real insight into how Mordenheim thinks. So I recommend it for that reason. Okay, with media influences out of the way, let's sketch out our adventure. In Act 1, at Level 2, the PCs attempt a burglary at Schloss Mordenheim, that is the castle where Dr. Mordenheim lives and conducts her ghastly experiments. It doesn't go well for them, and they end up getting knocked unconscious by monsters. In Act 2, at Level 3, the PCs wake up on operating tables in Victra Mordenheim's lab, and they discover that the doctor has performed surgery on them. Brain surgery, specifically in order to enable, indeed, obligate the PCs to perform a very specific task for her. They must brave the blizzards of Lamordia and make their way to Ludendorff, a nearby town which has an ancient secret, a secret which the PCs alone can decipher thanks to their brain surgery. So they do, and in Act 3 at Level 4, we run a deep and creeping darkness, where the PCs interact with creatures from another dimension. Once they have done so, we proceed to Act 4, where the PCs attempt to return to Schloss Mordenheim, their task complete. Their journey back, however, is interrupted by one of Dr. Mordenheim's creations, Elsie, a flesh golem who at first abducts the PCs and holds them prisoner, but who later joins their party in an assault on Schloss Mordenheim. Assuming the PCs are victorious in this assault, they must escape the castle, and the adventure comes to an end. So let's sketch this thing out in detail. The adventure begins with the PCs at level 2. They have just broken into Schloss Mordenheim, that is Mordenheim's castle, and their purpose is to attempt a burglary, steal whatever treasure there may be here. It's a castle, right? There's gotta be treasure. For a map of Castle Mordenheim, or at least for a map of part of it, we're going to use the Izzet League Experimental Workshop from the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. The PCs begin at the loading dock on the lowest level of the castle, whose doors slam shut behind the PCs and seal themselves off with both magic and electricity. We're going to divide the castle up into nine different areas, and here's what we're going to put in each of the areas. In Area 1, just as the PCs enter Schloss Mordenheim, there's a beast in a cage. It looks like some stitched-together combination of a wolf and a giant scorpion. It has the statistics of a manticore, and although it rails against the bars of its cage, it doesn't break free until several minutes later, at which point it rushes the PCs and fights to the death in a bestial frenzy. Nearby, in Area 2, on a shelf, there rests a brain in a jar from Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, as well as a death's head of the gnashing variety. The top of the death's head has been cut off, and its brains have been scooped out. PCs should realize that the brains are in fact in the jar. When the PCs approach, both the brain in the jar and the death's head fly off the shelf and attack the PCs at once, again fighting until they are destroyed. Further to the north, in Area 3, the PCs can find an apparatus hanging on the wall. It looks like a metal picture frame which crackles with electricity, but inside the PCs can see a vista, a gloomy vista that is filled with wailing, miserable, worm-like spirits. 
It's like the Lost Souls room from Beetlejuice. What is this? That's the Lost Souls room. The PCs cannot interact with the spirits, and they cannot interact with the apparatus in any meaningful way. But if they succeed on a DC-17 Intelligence Arcana check, they can realize that they are looking into the realm of Hades, another plane of existence, through this apparatus. Over to the east, in Area 4, there are a pair of objects that look like metallic tents that crackle with electricity. In fact, they look like the teleportation pods from the 1986 adaptation of The Fly. Crouching nearby is a humanoid creature. It looks like a human being, except for it has the head of a giant spider and one of the limbs of a giant spider as well. It crouches mournfully, lost in thought, and doesn't react to the PCs or do anything unless a PC gets its attention on purpose or approaches within 15 feet of it. At that point, it attacks and fights to the death using the statistics of an Ettercap. If any of the PCs enter the metal tent, they can teleport into the other metal tent by pressing a button on the inside. If they do this, though, there is a 25% chance that they will re-emerge with one of their limbs replaced with a limb of a giant insect. The change is purely cosmetic, we're not going to add any new special mechanics for this, but it is also permanent. There's no way to undo it short of a wish spell. Meanwhile, in the stairwell, which is Area 5, the floor is littered with overexposed photographs and ruined photography paper. A flash bulb camera rests on a tripod nearby. If any PCs touch the camera, the flash goes off, and suddenly a group of specters materializes near the PCs. They have the same faces as the PCs, or faces that look like the PCs' faces, and they immediately attack, fighting until they are destroyed. The camera doesn't do anything after this. Upstairs in Area 6, Filthy children's toys litter the floor, and nearby, a hulking flesh golem snores loudly. The golem does not stir or wake up for any reason until later, specifically if the DM needs some help knocking the PCs unconscious. That may not be a problem, though, because in Area 7, there's a study which, in addition to being filled with books and notes and journals, there is a creature here. Its body is a helmed horror, but in the place of a head, there's a brain in a jar. Indeed, the whole creature looks like the monster Veneranda from Rime of the Frost Maiden. As soon as it spots the PCs, it attacks them relentlessly, fighting to the death, saying nothing but intruders, intruders, intruders. The documents in this room consist in indecipherable mathematical equations and chemical notes, the only exception being a piece of paper on which is desperately scrawled the words, It's alive! It's alive! Area 8 is an operating room, a medical operating room that's prepped for surgery. It has all manner of medical machines and instruments, shining with laborious polish and crackling with electricity. The EEG, the BP monitor, and the AVV. Yes, certainly, Doctor. And uh, get the machine that goes bing! And speaking of electricity, Area 9 contains a pair of electrical coils, and arcs of lightning jump from one coil to the other. Tethered to these coils, by way of thick black cables, are a pair of flame skulls. Only, instead of being on fire, we're going to say that these floating skulls crackle with arcs of electricity. Each one can cast lightning bolt instead of fireball, and each one attacks with a lightning ray that does lightning damage instead of a fire ray that does fire damage. These creatures are also hostile and fight until they are destroyed. However, if PCs attack the cables, which have an AC of 13 and 13 hit points, or if the PCs attack the coils themselves, which have an AC of 17 and 17 hit points, they can destroy the skulls that way. Now, as the PCs move from chamber to chamber witnessing their horrors, the DM should maintain the goal of knocking the PCs unconscious. A TPK is what we actually want here. To make sure it happens, you might have the Flesh Golem wake up and attack the PCs right as they are attacked by the creature whose body is a helmed horror and whose head is a brain in a jar. The goal is to knock the PCs unconscious, preferably after they've had a chance to look at and be horrified by some of the attractions in this castle. Now, once the PCs are knocked unconscious, they proceed to level 3, and we go to Act 2. In Act 2, at level 3, the PCs wake up on operating tables, the ones that they could have seen in Area 8. They have pounding headaches, their faces are covered with stitches, and at least one limb from each PC has been removed and replaced with the limb of an animal. We're going to say that this change is cosmetic yet permanent, and it is the least of the PC's worries. As the PCs sit up, Dr. Victra Mordenheim strides into view. She notifies the PCs that she's performed brain surgery on each of them. She's made a couple of changes. The first change is to prevent the PCs from attacking her. Sure enough, 
The PCs soon find that if they try to attack Victra, if they try to raise a weapon or cast a spell that would result in her harm, they feel a slight electrical jolt in their heads, and they're just unable to carry out the intention. They just cannot attack her. In addition, with her brain surgery, Victra Mortenheim has enabled the PCs to peer into another dimension, a dimension that overlaps with our own. She calls it the Nether Dimension. It's filled with horrible things and creatures and structures, but they don't interact with us because we don't detect each other normally. Yet the PCs are able to see and interact with things from the nether dimension. To demonstrate, and to prove that the experiment worked, Victra walks over to a nearby steel cabinet. She undoes its lock and opens the doors. Out of the doors spill a pair of mean locks. They look somewhat translucent, they have a violet color, and Mordenheim says these are the creatures that inhabit the nether dimension. You should be able to see them just fine, and they can see you. They're not friendly. I advise you to defend yourselves. And there, in the operating room, the PCs must fight these two mean locks to the death. Assuming the PCs defend themselves and defeat the mean locks, Victra Mordenheim claps and cheers. Her experiment was a success. Now, she says, she has a task for the PCs. Within the next seven days, she wants the PCs to travel to the city of Ludendorff and seek out an inn called the Breaking Wave. There, there should be an entrance to a passage which can only be seen if you can peer through the nether dimension. She wants the PCs to go into that passage, kill some creatures that are down there, and harvest the essence from their bodies, which they can bring back to her. If the PCs refuse, or if they take longer than seven days, Victra will detonate an explosive device which he has placed in each of the PCs' heads. There's no getting out of it, and there's no resisting it either since the PCs are helpless to attack Victra. So off they go. The journey takes about two days, so the PCs will have to camp overnight in the wilderness at least for one night. And along the way, they face four wolves that attack the PCs and fight until they're at half health, a herd of caribou, which are just 10d6 elk who are neutral to the PCs unless the PCs attack, and maybe, shortly before the PCs reach Ludendorff, a cold light walker, if they can handle it. I would also let one of the encounters occur during a blizzard, as outlined in Icewind Dale, Rime of the Frost Maiden. As the PCs arrive in Ludendorff, they level up to 4, and we proceed to Act 3. Now for Act 3, when the PCs are level 4, we're just going to run A Deep and Creeping Darkness from Candlekeep Mysteries. We'll make a couple changes to it, though. First, we're going to let the town of Vermelon be part of Ludendorff, and we're going to say that it is full of ordinary, hard-working commoners. Second, we're going to let the PCs perceive mean locks all around the town. Ludendorff's citizens are ignorant of these creatures, but the PCs can see them quite clearly. As soon as the mean locks spot the PCs, they immediately flee, and they go towards the inn, which is the breaking wave. Once there, they sneak inside and disappear. Speaking of which, third, we're going to replace the mayor's house with the inn, the breaking wave. For a map, you could use the map of any ordinary inn. It could be the Blue Water Inn from Curse of Strahd. It could be the Elfsong Tavern from Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus. The only addition which we're going to make is a violet, translucent trapdoor in the center of the inn's floor. Nobody else can see it except the BCs. The trapdoor is part of the nether dimension, as is the series of tunnels it leads to. Now, the PCs can interact with the guests at the inn normally. They can order food and drinks. They could even stay the night. Everything appears normal except for that trapdoor. And should the PCs attempt to interact with that trapdoor, they are immediately attacked by two mean locks that rush out of the shadows at the PCs. As the battle proceeds, the guests at the inn gasp and cry out, they cannot see the creatures that the PCs are fighting, after all, so it looks like the PCs have lost their minds and started waving their weapons around for no reason. Eventually, someone calls the town guards, and a few guards will arrive shortly, making efforts to capture the PCs. The PCs, however, can escape this fate by opening the trapdoor and descending into its depths. From everyone else's point of view, it just looks like the PCs have disappeared into the floorboards. Now beneath the trapdoor, just put the platinum mine from a deep and creeping darkness. Add between four to six mean locks down there, have the PCs encounter them in groups of one or two, and also stipulate that when a mean lock dies down in these caverns, it leaves behind some kind of weird phosphorescent substance that the PCs can collect. It's the essence that Victor Mordenheim is looking for for her experiments. When the PCs have killed all the mean locks, they can return to the breaking wave the way that they came, or, if the DM is feeling merciful, they might be able to find a passage that deposits them just outside town so they can avoid the guards. Either way, once the PCs have left those tunnels, they level up to 5 and we proceed to Act 4. In Act 4, at level 5, the PCs journey back to Schloss Mordenheim. Along the way, they encounter a pair of cold light walkers. 
This is a substantial challenge. If the Cold Light Walkers knock the PCs unconscious, then the very last thing which the PCs remember before losing consciousness is a woman, a flesh golem covered in stitches, who leaps into the fray and starts beating the Cold Light Walkers with her fists. If the two Cold Light Walkers do not knock the PCs unconscious, however, then shortly thereafter a snowdrift collapses beneath the PCs' feet and they fall down into a dark cavern, hitting their heads and falling unconscious. Either way, the PCs get knocked unconscious, and they're going to wake up in the captivity of a flesh golem, Elsie, the prize creation of Victra Mordenheim. Indeed, when the PCs wake up, they're locked in a cage, in a cave somewhere, with Elsie staring them down. She demands to know who they are, and why they're working for Victra Mordenheim. She doesn't reveal any information about herself at first, and the PCs soon find that the very same condition which prevented them from attacking Victra Mordenheim also prevents them from attacking Elsie. They cannot raise their weapons against Elsie, or even begin to cast a spell that would result in Elsie's harm. They get the same weird, electrical, forbidding sensation. Now, at first, Elsie does not care about the PCs. She just wants information out of them and plans to kill them. But if the PCs cooperate, and if they succeed on a couple of DC-14 charisma-based checks, Elsie softens and tells a little bit about who she is. She talks about her creation at the hands of the cruel Dr. Mordenheim about Mordenheim's attempts to control her and use her as a thing, as an instrument, and also about her escape and her vows to take revenge on the Doctor. Here it might be fun to take some actual quotes from the monster in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Eventually, Elsie agrees to let the PCs go on the sole condition that they join her in an assault on Schloss Mordenheim and an attack on the Doctor herself. The PCs will probably mention their brain implants, and Elsie will reveal that she has a device which can undo the effects of those implants. And indeed, she makes an appeal to this device in her offer. So assuming the PCs agree to Elsie's offer, she joins the party, and the gang returns to Schloss Mordenheim. All the same monsters are there, except for the ones that the PCs killed in Act 1, and also except for the Flesh Golem, who has since fled the castle. Kind of a pattern there. If it is still alive, the creature whose body is a helmed horror, and whose head is a brain in a jar, attacks the PCs as soon as they arrive. It fights until it is destroyed, and once it is destroyed, the PCs can find Dr. Mordenheim somewhere else in the castle. As soon as Mordenheim is in sight, Elsie produces a device which looks like an old-fashioned remote control, and she presses a singular button at the very center of it. Once she presses the button, the PCs have the sensation that they are able to attack Mordenheim, at which point they probably should. Victra Mordenheim has the statistics of a Witherbloom Pledge Mage, or, if you want her to be really challenging, you could give her the statistics of a Weatherbloom Professor. These creatures can be found in Strixhaven Curriculum of Chaos. She fights until she has zero hit points, at which point she doesn't die or fall unconscious, but instead collapses to the floor and surrenders. When this happens, Elsie turns to the PCs and orders them to leave, explaining that she has unfinished business with the Doctor, which is best conducted in private. If the PCs refuse to leave, then she will turn hostile toward them, but assuming they leave, the PCs find that Lamordia's snow-covered fields are enshrouded with mist and fog. It's the Ravenloft mists, the mists of the Shadowfell, they have rolled in from the sea. Will they whisk the PCs off to another domain of dread, or will they permit the PCs to stay? That's up to the DM's discretion. Either way, however, their adventure in Lamordia, this adventure, has come to an end. So, that's our adventure in Lamordia. What do you think? Did the inclusion of Mordenheim and Elsie please you? What did you think of the idea of brain surgery to allow the PCs to peer into another realm of existence? And what else would you add to this adventure if it were to be longer? Would you add Baron von Albrecher, the brain in a jar? Let me know in the comments. Thanks everyone for watching. Please don't forget to do all the internet things. Click like and subscribe. Don't forget to hit the bell icon if you want notifications on new videos on this channel. And thanks!